So the first thing is the specific surface area of the geomaterial. Pozzolanic activity that is the lime deactivity. It talks about the percentage of free lime which is present in the soil mass. Cation exchange capacity for the value liquid to solid ratio L by S, pH of the soil solution. Now what is your feeling if pH varies both sides of the you know normal value or neutral value what should happen to KD? It will remain same or it should change or it should change because both sides of the pH equal to 7 either pH less than 7 or pH more than 7 the tendency of the system would be different. More aggressive the environment more acidic the environment the chances are that KD will be less because the system itself is unstable under more acidity. Buffer capacity of the sorbent, temperature, grain size, presence of other ions. Now this is what actually gives rises to the competitive sorption which I was talking about. Dimension of the ion and its valency. Okay. So when you say presence of other ions, there is a sort of a competition going on between different cations that which one should get adhered for which is going to get a chance to get adhered onto the clay or the solids. Their ionic strength, valency, organic contents particularly iron manganese oxides. If you have more iron oxides the cation exchange capacities are going to be less is it not and hence the distribution coefficients are going to be less. The carbonate content carbonate content if it is more in the soil mass the soil mass becomes passive and hence these parameters will get affected accordingly. Let us talk about now batch sorption test. We take the geometrial in the powder form and add contaminant in the solution form. This interaction is allowed for a certain duration with continuous stirring and the factors which are important or which influence this interaction would be liquid to solid ratio and interaction time. Now if C i is the initial concentration of the contaminant in the liquid phase, C e is the concentration of the contaminant in the solution after time interaction time is to be recorded after a certain time interaction time is to be recorded by sampling the solution frequently and the CS is the concentration of the contaminant which is sorbed. Now this is the equation which gives you CS. Now if you know CS this will be nothing but initial concentration minus CE. So what is CE? The concentration of contaminant in the solution. So this divided by CE will give you inverse of KD clear because CS is the concentration of the solids divided by CE is nothing but CW. So this way you will be getting if you plot CE with respect to time for different L by S what you will notice is that after certain time the concentration which is remaining in the solution remains practically constant. Now this is the equilibration time or this is the interaction time. So the question which you had asked you have to establish for each contaminant porous system what is the equilibration time beyond which the concentration in the solution is not going to change. Once you have got this time, you can go ahead with your test. Now comes the concept of isotherms. So the first isotherm, isotherm word is a misnomer here. Please understand, isotherm is normally used for the equal temperatures, but it has nothing to do when we talk about the concentration profiles. So linear isotherm is given as LR, where CS equal to KD into CE. CS is the concentration sorbed on the solids, C is the concentration of cations or contaminants in the solution phase. This is one way of defining it. Another way of defining is a Langmuir isotherm LM. So this is how this equation is given C upon C is equal to 1 upon KD into B, C E upon B. B is a unknown. So if you are using Langmuir isotherm by doing lot of experiments you have to establish for a given contaminant porous media the values of B so that you can use this B values and you can use this equation to get KD parameter. 
the third one is known as friendlish isotherm fh where log of cs equal to log of kd plus some co coefficient n inverse of that multiplied by log of ce now in this form you have to plot the results on y axis you have ce cs on x axis you have ce so if you plot using linear isotherm you will be getting these type of relationships if you use langmuir isotherm you will be getting this type of relationship between ce by cs and ce so the slope of this line will give you 1 upon kd slope of this lines will give you kd here n parameter can be obtained so the intercept on the y axis will give you log of kd and hence you can obtain kd value so these are different techniques of plotting the results which you get from the batch experiments now the question is which isotherm i should select what you are not noticing here is for the same experiment for the same test results the trends are different and what you notice is that fh that is the friendlish gives the best possible fit clear now there could be a situation where lr gives you a better fit or lm gives you a better fit so you have to plot all the three types of isotherms and justify that why you are selecting a certain type of isotherm once you have selected this you can get the value of kd directly is this part clear and of course these two isotherms are named after the researchers who have proposed them this option process will be a inverse phenomena so here if you use the words like csl what is csl the amount of contaminants which is present in the sorbate after desorption phenomena and cel is the equilibrium concentration of contaminants present in the solution after equilibration time and cs is the concentration of the contaminant which is getting solved so using this expression you can get csl and then again you can use the same equations only thing is the parameters will get changed by l so this is the leaching or the desorption phenomena csl is leaching cel is leaching and so on and then what you have to do is you have to establish the equilibration time for leaching that means for different l by s if you plot what is the value of cel with respect to time now cel is nothing but the equilibration concentration of contaminant in the solution it's very easy you can dip your electrodes take the solution measure the concentration of a contaminant and then again you have to find out after which time practically there is no change in the cel value that means even if the leaching is taking place nothing leaches out much into the solution phase and hence this is the most critical value so this again becomes your equilibration time so once you have got this equilibration time the leaching should be done only for that period and by using these isotherms again you can get the parameters associated with leaching which is kd so you know sorption coefficient you know desorption coefficient is this part okay it must be giving you a feel of how these parameters are obtained nothing more than that you need not to worry too much don't try to remember these equations and all only thing is you should understand that given parameters how you can obtain what is desirable and how it is obtained now just to give you an idea about uh, the c c and kd interrelationship i have included some minerals for a soil where quartz and monmolonite both are present it's a typical marine clay and what you'll notice is that the cc varies from 49 to 57 and the kd is 3000 to 3600 about however if you have quartz and orthoclase like your white clay kaolin where the cation exchange capacity will be very very small and then kd will also be very small so what is your conclusive remark by looking at these values even if the mineralogy is not favorable clear the surface area itself is contributing towards kd up to a certain extent you got this point so even if you are working on a passive soil where the minerals are not very active the fineness itself is good enough to give you more parking lots for cations to get parked simply on the top of this would be the mineralogy where the tendency of the soil is to catch more and more cations onto it 
and then you can correlate CEC and KD directly. More CEC, more KD. So a day should come where just based on KD, you should be able to characterize the soil mass and its activity and reactivity towards the environment. That would be the ultimate in our subject. Clear? So if you, if you think of a situation like any type of a soil, any type of contaminant and you have a matrix of KD values. So looking at the KD values itself, you can say that this seems to be a combination between clay and this type of a contaminant and that can be, you know, very much useful to the professionals. Now another interesting thing is if you plot KD as a function of L by S, what is Neha was asking, L by S is nothing but a sort of a moisture content. So this could be in the gravimetric moisture content form, liquid to solid con con form or even the volumetric moisture content form. So they are all similar. L by S is nothing but W and W is equivalent to theta. Clear? So if I plot this, what you will notice is if L by S is more, more mobility is there and hence KD will be more. Some other important relationships are if you plot KD with respect to time, now this is nothing but the interaction time. So more the interaction time, more KD, clear? Similarly, KD versus pH. Now this is what I had asked you some time back that what is your intuitive feeling that if pH changes, look at this, just about 7, it touches a minimum. So in the acidic ranges, KD happens to be varying too much for a given type of a porous media soil system. However, this curve cannot be generalized so easily. So this is one of the trends which somebody might have got for his or her experiments. And on the you know, basic side, that is when pH is more than 7, the influence on KD is not much. Exactly, that is what I have been telling you because this is the acidic environment where the system itself is very unstable. So what is going to happen in the long term is not very known. And mind you, all these experiments have been done for less than 24 hours. So within 24 hours, degradation of the porous media is ruled out. But the biggest challenge is the parameters which you are getting in the laboratory, how you are going to delegate them to the field situations. And one of the challenges would be how to talk about the pH changes on the KD parameter. Well, there was another philosophy that which was proposed by Dr. Naidu in 2006. What he tried to do is he tried to link electrical conductivity with L by S. So I am sure you will agree with this that if liquid to solid ratio is more, what will happen to the electrical conductivity? It will decrease. When the concentration of ions is less, in, on this axis when you move from x to y, the concentration of ions is becoming less and hence conductivity is decreasing. So we wanted to develop a nomograph without doing so much of work just by measuring electrical conductivity which is very easy to measure. You just have to have electrode, ion selective electrode which measures the electrical conductivity and from there I should be getting what is the value of sorption and desorption parameters. So we trained our methodology for different types of geomaterials, fly ashes, clays, rocks, clays, marine clays, kaolin and so on. And then we came up with a pro proposal that if you measure EC, which can be measured very easily, you can directly know the KD and you can also know the KDL. So both sorption and desorption parameters can be obtained just by measuring electrical conductivity, but this work remains incomplete and I have shared with you the philosophy. Let me quickly go through the column test. Is this part clear about the batch test? So in short, you are allowing interaction of the loose form of the material in the powder form with the contaminants and trying to find out the equilibration time beyond which no more 
sorption will take place on the solids and that is the point where you say the equilibration time and you find out what is the concentration solved onto the solids, what is the concentration remaining in the solution, average of the two will give you the KD parameter. And when you are doing desorption test, you take the contaminated soil, put it in fresh water and see how much is leaching out in a certain time. So that becomes equilibration time for leaching and within this time you are trying to again defining how much remains on the solid phase, how much comes out in the liquid phase and the ratio of the two will be KDL. Now let us talk about the column test. As I said, it will be very difficult to perform column tests in the prototype. So this is modeling exercise which is normally conducted in a centrifuge. We take a small sample where L is the length of the sample and this sample is packed in a container. The bottom of this setup, there is a water table. So whatever percolates through this comes out and gets accumulated into the cistern or the standing water table. So you can dose the system from the top, whatever percolates will be getting collected into the outer cylinders. Now this is where the concept of pore volume comes into the picture. How many pore volumes of the contaminant you have to pour from the top so that something meaningful comes out of the sample. So this is where you have to define how many pore volumes are present in the soil mass. In any compacted soil mass, the biggest question is when it gets completely saturated and when it will start expelling water out from it, clear? So this number PV is nothing but the volume of the solution multiplied by porosity of the system and this is nothing but the volume of the sample. So inverse of the volume into porosity multiplied by volume of solution is nothing but pore volumes where L is the length of the sample or the thickness of the sample, D is the diameter of the sample and volume is the V volume is the volume of the solute passing through the sample. Now in this situation important thing would be how much time I should allow for the interaction. How would you obtain this? This is a very big question. I hope you, you will realize this. Now this is a relationship which you will be getting, the breakthrough curve. If you remember on the y axis this is CT by C0, the concentration which is coming out from the downstream side, you collect, analyze it in a atomic absorption or ICP, get the value of CT and C0 is the concentration of the fluid which is being put into. So the normalized CT by C0 value is nothing but 0 to 1, it will vary. Now as time increases, what happens? CT by C0 will start increasing and it will go up to a maximum value. Now the moment it becomes close to 0.9, now this is where we started washing it. So you add fresh water so that the desorption process takes place. So this is the sorption process or the sorption breakthrough curve and this is the desorption breakthrough curve. You can go for several cycles of sorption desorption to understand what is the resilient modulus of the material as far as sorption desorption is concerned. See you have talked about resilient modulus for loading, static both as well as the dynamic loading. Here we can expose the sample to chemical loading in cycles and we would like to see what is the characteristic of porous media contaminant interaction. Is this part clear? Now the tail of this graph over here corresponds to something. What it says is up to this much portion of the graph where CT by C0 is almost 0. What is the significance of this? No concentration of contaminant is coming out of sample. That means if you check out from here, this will give you a time up to which the system has a tendency to sorb only. So this is the sorbing capacity of the material. Now after this more and more flux of chemicals come into the system and what happens? There is the accumulation of concentration and hence CT by C0 keeps on increasing very rapidly 
and again you will notice a time comes where further change in ct becomes almost negligible and this is the point where you say saturation limit of the material that means no further interaction is going to take place between contaminant and porous system and this is where if you add fresh water somewhere here what will happen the desorption will start so this is the best way of doing sorption desorption in a column experiment this work is also by the way incomplete because of the lack of time we could not do this work completely now coming back to the modeling part so another 5 minutes you just try to understand what i have been discussing this is the crux of the whole discussion you have been utilizing this equation to define contaminant transport in xt domain x is the distance or zt domain z is the distance and t is the time so del c by del t equal to di into del square c by del z square minus vs c by velocity del c by del z dry density of the media kd now kd is the principal known or unknown known sarika dev is known upon porosity into del c by del t now there could be a situation where kd is principal known as well as principal unknown if you are doing field experiments what happens then it's a principal unknown but if you are doing batch tests then your kd is a principal known so you can do both type of modeling forward and reverse modeling that is the beauty of this type of exercise so if you put these terms together del c by del t plus 1 that is 1 plus rho d kd by eta this will be equal to di del square c by del z square minus this if r is equal to 1 plus <coughs> rho dry into kd upon porosity now this r term which is appearing here is known as retardation coefficient what is the physical meaning of the word retardation stop is it not retained so r is the retardation factor which is directly proportional to kd so more the kd the tendency of the porous media is to retard the contaminant transport clear so in the same time the system is getting more and more retardation the contaminants are not going to flow out easily and hence kd will also depict a dynamic phenomena i think somebody was talking about so that you were asking about the time dependent situation so because r is a parameter which includes kd and kd is going to be time dependent by virtue of these qualities you can do time modeling for contaminant transport however if you do the centrifuge modeling where you must be using this law i'm sure for a given model p is the prototype m is the model suppose this is sample a so you can say that tp equal to t model of a into n a to the power y and if i am testing many models i can generalize this equation like this and if i take their log form this is what it's going to happen now if you look at the previous graph which i have shown you the btc the breakthrough curves for sorption desorption which one is more steep sorption or desorption desorption so what is the meaning of this if i find out the y value it will be more for sorption or desorption so when your y term is 0.5 it's very fast it is less than 1 so that means for desorption the scaling law would be tp equal to tm n to the power 0.5 clear so this is how you can establish the scaling laws for the entire exercise so what is the moral of the story the moral of the story is all this was done to understand how contaminants and geomaterials are going to interact and this interaction can lead to all this what is possible so at the end of the day if i know di if i know vs 
if i know kd porosity is known del c by del t can be monitored by doing experiments and then i can work out what is del c by del z that means rate of change of concentration at a given depth means distance and if i reverse this problem if del c by del z is known i can find out what is the concentration migration at a given point at a given time two applications the third one is if del c by del t is known del c by del z is known i can get the material properties also that means contaminant transport equation can also be utilized for characterization of porous media the fourth application would be if you know the porous media if you know del c by del t if you know del c by del z you can use this equation for obtaining what type of contaminant transport is taking place advective diffusive if vs is zero what is di if di is zero what is vs and so on so these are five six combinations which can be worked on by using ade and the biggest question was how to get the parameters so this is what we have discussed in details so with this i finish chemical characterization of geomaterials and then hopefully from next lecture onwards i'll be talking about thermal characterization electrical characterization now one question still remains in my mind is we have been talking about environmental geomechanics so where is the mechanics component coming into all this and that has to be realized so if you concentrate on the very first lecture i have been talking about that we are not talking about the mechanical forces mechanical stresses directly we are talking about the stresses which have been ignored till now like thermal flux electrical flux chemical flux combination of these fluxes along with mechanical stresses which are going to act on the system so that is where actually you require the concepts of environmental geomechanics to solve a problem in total or details okay